Matthews. Hey, how are you doing? Hello, hello. My name is Jashank. I'm one of the first year tutors. I'm standing in for Andrew today who made the fatal mistake of looking at time zone code yesterday and hasn't stopped screaming since. Uh, and it wasn't even normal time zone code, it was your assignment ones. Which really does justify the screaming. Um, aside from that rather possibly terrifying introduction, please don't panic. Everything is completely under control. Um, one thing to remember though is that coming up this Friday and into next week we have a public holiday. So if you have a tut lab on Friday, there are makeup labs and tutes, I believe, which are actually probably on now, so that would explain maybe some of those empty seats. And of course, next week is mid sem break. So you get time away from the hustle and bustle of university life, potentially. But if you haven't yet started assignment one, the only acceptable reason to do so at this point is that everything has been on fire. Your computer, your phone, etc. Um, you, if you haven't started assignment one, it is due soon. It is due next week. So, if you haven't already started, you should start now. So, if you are also looking for some help with those assignment, with, with that assignment, there are help sessions, you can head along to those, and our army of wonderful tutors will be able to help you out. Now, before we get too much further, I want to just give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about today. Yesterday, we talked a lot about arrays, and we talked a lot about strings and characters in C. Today, we're going to be going further with that. We're going to be looking at how we can work with strings, manipulate them a bit. And we're also going to be playing around with some command line argument handling. So, that's all coming up in the next couple of moments. So, let me just... Uh, take you back to yesterday. Yesterday we talked about arrays in C and as hopefully we made sort of apparent to you, an array in C is just a collection of data all sitting right up against its neighbours. Kind of like you guys, you're all a great big array. So yesterday we talked about arrays being this bundle of data, but what happens if we haven't initialized any of the values in that? What would this printf here print? When I give you this array of size, size, it doesn't really matter how big it is, let's say four, if I were to run this code, what would happen? What would we get? Anyone like to hazard a guess? I hear one bunch of random numbers. Do I have any other offers from the floor? <coughs> Zeros? I like that answer, that's a nice answer. Random numbers, another good answer. Any advances on? Zeros? Or particular numbers? Or random numbers? Here's something that whenever I'm programming and I come across, and I, even I now after however many years it's been, even I still when I'm setting out to write programs, I sometimes go, well, I'm not sure what that does. And the best way to find out is to try it and see. So let's grab this, let's dump it over into a text file. Uh, what do we call it? Uh, my apologies for those of you who've been following along with code from lectures. I do not have the whiz-bang machinery that Andrews have uh, to show you this code live. So for now, it's just on screen, but it will be going up after the lecture. So let me just drop this bunch of code down. 
Let me also put in our boilerplate. I'm going to need STDIO because I'm going to be printing. I'm also going to do something a little bit peculiar, and we're going to come back to this uh, a little bit later on today, in today's lecture. You've probably all up to this point been writing something like int main void to start your programs, and that's all very nice. But later on today, uh, we're going to be explaining the meaning of this particular wonderful magic construct. So let's start using it now. Instead of int main void, we're going to use this magic stanza, which I have typed so many times, and you all will just have this in your muscle memory. Int main is int argc char star argv square brackets. What does that mean? Just a bunch of line noise. We'll talk about that in a moment, so don't panic. More of that coming in a second. So here is our program. We have an array of size. Let's give it a size. We said four earlier. Size is four. So there's our program. Let me. Man, how do people cope with mice that don't work? Piece of paper. Of course I have a piece of paper. Why wouldn't I have a piece of paper? I don't have a large talk slowly sign, I'm afraid. So if I'm talking too fast, yell at me. I also get excited. I think it's a feature of computer programmers. OK, whoops, that's a calculator. I don't want a calculator. Cool. So we're going to compile this DCC. Let me just make this a little bit less scary as well. I can keep forgetting. That's better. DCC. We're going to be compiling array into array.c. Sorry, at array array.c into array. I'm going to do array successfully. Who wants it over here that bid on a bunch of random numbers? Fantastic. You have bid wisely. You get a bunch of random numbers. What do these numbers mean? Who knows? I don't know. One of the things to be aware of, though, is uninitialized data is what we call in C undefined behavior. There is no reasonable value we could put in that array. Perhaps you want to use zero for something important, so we can't just fill it with zeros. Minus one, maybe you're using minus one. Maybe I'm using a different data type, like doubles or floats, where zero just being dumped in there may mean something completely different. So we can't really just dump in a bunch of zeros and hope for the best. What we can do, what we can do though, is we can initialize this array. And the way we do this is what we call array initializer syntax, amazingly enough. And the way we use that is we say when we're declaring our array, you can't do this anywhere else. Only when you are declaring and initializing your array can you use array initializer syntax. With a set of curly braces here, I can just put in the values I want to go into this array. OK, so that's a pretty reasonable idea. So I could put in, say, because I'm extremely imaginative. And I could compile this and run it, and I would get 1511, as I would expect. I heard someone call it 1511 the other day, and it sounded so very strange. Um, OK. So we have here now initialized our array, but you'll notice I've given you exactly four things when I'm initializing this array. So here's a question. What would happen if I didn't give it four things? What would I get? Well, as is the norm with such questions like these, the correct answer is to try it and see. So let's do that. Let us take this array. Instead of loading all of these values into it, let's just dump in one value. I haven't given you any of the other values here. There is nothing up my sleeves except my 
horribly mangled arm. Note, typing is bad for you. Do remember to take breaks. Okay, so where did the zeros come from? It turns out C is actually really nice. So if I don't give it enough values to initialize this array, the remaining values are going to be zero. That's really nice. Um, incidentally, for those of you who are coming in with experience of other programming languages, I know you're out there. I'm not going to ask you to identify yourselves. I do, however, want you to know this, that in C, arrays do not behave as you would expect them to. If you have programmed in Python or Java or any of these other whiz-bang crash-hot languages, everything you know about arrays is a lie. It's true. So, well, what happens if we just leave out the 1511 and we just leave a set of curly braces here? My guess, we're going to get a bunch of zeros again. And so we do. So, the gentleman over on this side who said a bunch of zeros was you there? <coughs> Hello. Um, you're sort of right. Because these things, these sort of look the same. But they mean very different things. So this is not the same as me saying, here is an array. Remember, these two things mean different things. One of these says, I am declaring a variable. It's going to be called array. It's going to have type int, square bracket, size. But the other one says, I'm going to declare an array called int, square bracket, size. And I am going to initialize it with some values. And it turns out that if you don't give it any values, all the remaining values are zero. This is very useful. OK, are we happy with that? OK. So we've seen that initializing an array is as simple as just chucking a set of braces on the end of it and giving it a value. And then we see our array becomes entirely zeros. But uh, we've just talked about array initializers. And I, we've also talked about being able to load in a bunch of values. But what's another way we could do this? Well, because this is C, and really with most things in any of these wonderful computer machine things, there are many ways to do the same thing. Now, one obvious way to initialize this might be to set all of the values myself. So I could come along and go, array 0 is 0, array 1 is 0, array 2 is 0. But as you can tell by the typos I'm making, this is not only hard to do, but it's just long and boring and repetitive and we have a way of dealing with long, boring, repetitive tasks, don't we? Yes, we do. What is it? I hear some muttering. Loops. Yes. Good grief. We've talked about this not even a week ago, and you've all gone loopy. So let us grab this eye from up here. Incidentally, one of the things that I do when I'm coding is that I will tend to use uh, a sort of keyboard shortcuts in tools like Gedit, which are quite difficult to see. So if I remember, I will try and point these out. What I've just done here, this is one of my favorite key bindings in Gedit. If you hold Alt and use the up and down arrow keys, you can grab an entire line of code, or even multiple lines of code, and move them up and down. If you haven't seen that, it's wonderful. I love it. It's so beautiful for making functions and changing the structure of your code. So we're going to loop over i to size, and we're going to set array elements at i to 0. So that's the other way we can do it, completely as you would expect. Both of these are completely fine to use.
Anything wrong with this code? I++, plus plus, yes. I'm glad someone's awake. Question, who's awake? Oh dear. Clearly you've all gone to sleep after the grand opening, so shall I do it again? No, I won't. Um, so there we have our I++. Plus plus. And now this loop won't go on forever. OK. So in seeing a loop, we can initialize with values like, say, our array index is another example of a value we can put in here. Or we can do some calculation. Or we could read in characters from the user. And with strings, we can do much the same thing. Yeah? Now, yesterday we talked a bit about strings, and we know that a string is just a sequence of characters all pressed right up against each other. And we've seen that there are some functions that know how to handle sequences of characters all pressed up against each other. So here's one way we could do this. Incidentally, Andrew's warned you about this. Other Andrew will scream at you about this. So I'm going to lend my two cents and scream at you about this. If you use the ASCII codes, or if you've gone and memorized the ASCII codes, you have done yourself a disservice. There is no reason to do so. The computer has a much better memory than you do. The computer has a much better memory than I do. I don't know, well, actually I do, but that's more from my misspent youth. I do know what those ASCII values are, but I don't expect you to, and honestly, I don't remember. I'd have to work most of them out. But I could just chuck it in single quotes, and there I have the character. Remember that this character, in single quotes, what we call a character literal, because it is literally a character. It is that character's value. The compiler sees it, goes, yep, that is the value that sits beneath this. All right? And interchangeably, we could put integers in, but why would you want to? And of course, we have some shorthand in C. Actually, let me hop back over here to my code. And let's talk about something a little bit strange, which is that if I do leave some characters in here, Let me give you some more characters as well. Um, I'll give it 10. Another thing to remember, don't forget, you are allowed to use line breaks. Line breaks are whoa. Line breaks are good for you and good for your code. Right. If I have a sequence of characters like this, again, as you saw, this is long, this is laborious, and relies on me being able to type a bunch of characters reliably. I'm not always able to do that. Uh, so one way we can get around this is we can just drop the whole thing in double quotes. Yeah, be very careful. Some of the languages may go, ha ha, single quotes, double quotes, they're the same thing. Ha ha ha. No, they're not. There's a, there's a massive difference between the two types of quotes. In C in particular, single quotes give you a character literal, but double quotes give you a string literal. For all intents and purposes, though, these things are the same. Yeah? Are they? So one thing about strings that people often forget, strings are made up of characters. Trying to deal with strings, these character arrays, when your type is not char, is a bad time. Don't do it. Make sure whenever you're dealing with character arrays like strings, you use the right type. And it's not just for the reason of, oh, I want to make sure my computer knows what type this is. This is actually a great convenience, because most parts of the C standard library 
because C has a standard library, a whole collection of functions that you might want to use, and we'll have a look at that shortly. These all expect character arrays to be stored in strings. Yeah? So I could print this out. And I'll get myself a sequence of ASCII values, all very interesting. But what if I don't want to have to shuffle around these ASCII values? We saw a function yesterday that lets us print out characters, which was... We heard, yes, there's a format code for printf, so we could use printf to do this. But there's another function. I hear put char. Yes. Put char is a function I could use here. And again, I could just go put char of array at i. Yeah? That's all perfectly valid. And if I just print out new line at the end, that's all rather wonderful. So array2, whoops, array2.c. Ta-da! We print out a bunch of characters. But this is annoying because I might want to print out these strings of characters without having to go to the effort of looping over them. And because these are characters in a character array, I can print them out. Not only with put char or printf percent c to print out one character at a time. I can print out, and this is one of very few times you can do this, I can print out the entire array in one go. Ooh. Scandalous. So let's do it. If I want to print out a string, a character array, once again, we've got some functions to do it. We'll, use, we'll start off with printf, seeing as you've seen printf. So instead of percent %d or percent %lf or percent %c to print out a string, percent %s. Yeah? Percent %s, let's do it. So if I print f percent %c, uh, percent %s, excuse me, and I'll chuck a new line on the end there as well, of array, what do I expect? This is going to print out the array, as I would expect. And so it does, twice because our original code there is still intact. All right. Are we happy with this thus far? Now, we saw earlier that I could have broken this out and spelled this out character by character. Let me cheat and grab the sequence of characters that I have left here earlier. Ha ha ha! Ah! Ah! Damn it, computers! How do they work? What's going on? Stop that! Stop it! That's better. There we go. Uh, I do apologize, by the way. Windows is not my strong suit. I absolutely, absolutely detest Windows. And every time I use it, I usually wind up accidentally setting something on fire. All right. So here's a sequence of characters. And if I compile this, this will give me exactly the same results as well. But here's an interesting question. I've got size 10 here. But I've only got six characters that I'm printing. I don't need those extra four characters, so let's do that. Let's just use six characters. Yeah. And I'll just show you what this looks like, whoops, with this put char. I'm not expecting any astonishment at all, it'll just work. But if I use printf, percent s, something bad is going to happen. <laughs> So, remember, all we've changed here is the size of the array I'm setting out to print. Yep. I've said, instead of this array being 10 characters, which is far too many, 
this character array is now the right size for my set of characters. Yeah? But this should work, surely. Why? Why? What? So, if I were to run this, bad things have indeed wah, happened. Here it is, those bad things happening. Runtime error, illegal array, pointer, or other operation. This as I'm sure you will now be familiar with, and as you will over the next couple of weeks, and over the rest of this semester, and over the rest of the next few courses you do, you'll see this a lot if you're using DCC. DCC here is stopping bad things from happening, because DCC is nice. So let's try a different compiler. Let's try a compiler that is not nice that is ugly and mean and assumes you know what you're doing. And it has no objections to our code. There's nothing wrong with our code, per se. But... What? What? I... 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 Uh, what? So what's going on here? Because our put char is working just fine. But our print is just dumping random garbage over the screen. And there's actually a very good reason for this. Remember, all we've changed is the size of our array. Yeah? And remember also that when I change the size of my array, or when I initialize an array with less characters or with less values than the size of the array. So let's say I reverse this back to size 10. Remember this has the effect of putting some zeros at the end. Just a selection of nice calming zeros. I love zero. Zero is such a lovely number. I feel like that's a divisive issue because Andrew T I know loves prime numbers. Andrew B hates prime numbers. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting over here going, yeah, zero. Zero. It's a pretty divisive issue, that. Divisive? Because... Div uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, I do apologize. I, th yeah, that's just my sense of humor. Um, so, remember that this is what happens. We have a bunch of zeros sitting up the end there. And it turns out that all I need is one of them. So this sequence of six characters, I need seven characters for. I need to have a zero on the end. And it turns out that the way that functions work, like putcher, is they just print something out. But the way functions like printf, and we'll see another couple of these, put s and f put s in a moment, the way these functions work is by looking for that zero. What? Why are they looking for the, what? what I, why, are we, why do we have to put a zero there then? So let me ask you this question, my confused group of folks. If I have an array, I won't tell you anything about the array other than that here is my array. How big is it? How big is an array? The answer is in C, we don't know. We can't know. Because in C, arrays do not have size. Arrays in C do not have size. What you see here is some witchcraft to make you think that arrays have size. But the moment I give that array there into a function, I also have to either pass it size or have some other way of specifying how long it is. And with strings, as we saw when we looked at the ASCII table yesterday, there's a great command for this. Let me show you this beautiful thing. Great command, ASCII. 
which prints out the ASCII table. Whoa! And it turns out that if I give you a zero, zero in ASCII has been explicitly reserved. It is called null. And if I ask it to tell me about null, it will tell me that its official name is null. It has value zero. This is a very nice character because you can spot it. Every other one of those characters is, amazingly, not zero. So if we give it zero, this is what we would call a sentinel value. We see this value, we know we have reached the end of the string. So it turns out, this code we had earlier, where all I gave you was six characters into a ten character array, the reason that worked is basically by accident. So, here's where we stand. We have to have a sequence of characters. They have to be followed by a zero. If you want another way of writing that zero, instead of just dropping a zero there, you can use the character literal backslash zero. Remember that this is just a character. This is the character zero. Here it is over here. Decimal 48, hex 30, there is the character for the digit zero. This zero that we're talking about is not zero. This zero that we're talking about here is null, the literal value, the literal number zero. Yeah? So, one thing that I like doing when I'm teaching and we talk about strings, because every I've taught courses where everyone just forgets what you find on the end of a string. They make their arrays too small or they forget to account for the fact that there's a null on the end. So, what do you find on the end of a string? Uh, a null terminator. What do you find on the end of a string, folks? Yes! Remember that, it'll be on the exam. It probably will, actually. So, we see why this works, we see why we need a null, and it turns out that in C, when we just initialize an array with a double quoted string literal, that string there has hiding at the end of it where you can't see it, there's a null just here, just before this close quote. Yeah? So, that null gets written into this array. But here's a cool trick in C. What if I don't know how long that string might be, or I'm too lazy to go and count? Well, I don't actually have to say how big the array is either. If I just leave out the size, then that just works. And I could leave out this size, I could use the string literal instead of these character literals, and I'll just... Wah. Damn computers. I can just comment this out, and here I'll drop the string literal, Andrew. This array will be seven characters long. This array will have space for those seven characters. So, if I were to be building something like this, I can no longer use size. Because this doesn't make sense. As we've said before, arrays don't have size. Here's an array where I can't tell you how big it is. But I can tell you what I would find at the end of the section you're looking for, and that's that null terminator. So what I can do is instead of asking, while well, i is less than size, Instead of having this counting over the number of elements we have, I don't know how many elements we have, so I can be looking for that particular value. And while our array of i is not the null terminator, then we keep going. Yeah? Are we happy with this? If I were to run this, these two things would do the same thing. 
And I'll flip back to using DCC because, well, we can. We're not doing anything dangerous. There it is. All right. Cool. Uh, ah, yes. So here's an interesting question. What if I go the other way? What if I have an array that's not too big but too small for the space I am trying to fill? Or for the values I'm trying to put in them? Let's try it and see. So if I were to say instead our character array has size 2, preserve that for later, put that there, the compiler tells us off. This is only a warning of course, this is a yellow card, your red card's in the mail. Your red card is going to come if you actually try and do this. Remember, whenever you see a compiler warning, you stop and you go and fix it. Blindly assuming that everything will work is a recipe for disaster. Cool. And we've talked about how C will make it big enough for us. We've talked about the null terminator. So, that's strings. Before I move on, any questions on that? Question or thumb or okay? Cool, okay. Let's talk about something new. And you saw this earlier. If you've been paying attention, you've probably been compiling your code. Who hasn't compiled any code at all yet? Fantastic. There was one arm. There are two arms. These arms are worrying me. If you haven't compiled any code yet, uh, uh, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Go and compile some code. So, if you've been compiling your code, you would have seen that DCC, when I call it, I give it some arguments, I give it some parameters to say what I want it to do. Yeah? So when I'm compiling, say, hello.c, I want to produce a file called hello. These three arguments are the arguments I give it. And you'll notice these are separated by spaces. Pretty useful. Here, however, might be us actually running our program called hello. We just do dot slash hello. We have zero command line arguments. Yeah? We're not giving it any additional information for it to run with. But what if I wanted to? What if I wanted to build a tool that takes command line arguments like CD or LS or MV or RM or any of these other commands that you've been playing around with? Well, somehow we need to get that information into our program. And it turns out that when we tell you main doesn't take any arguments, the main function, that's not quite true. Main gets passed in two arguments, argc and argv. Int argc, that seems pretty reasonable, it's just a number. Char star argv square brackets. Those square brackets are empty for a good reason, which is that this is an array of strings. This is an array of arrays of characters this is an array of strings. How big is this array? It's an array. So the answer is, uh, I don't know. So what we need is a mechanism for telling us how many arguments there were, and that's what argc is for. Yeah? 
So if I flip over here to VLAB, woo, ah, Windows, stop that. Silly, silly keyboard. I swear, when they invented the mouse, they were out to get me. Int main, int argc, chasta argv. So, let us try and, well, how many arg arguments do we get? Let's find out, because that's just an integer. We can print out an integer. We know how to do that. We have the technology. So I can just percent %d that. And I'll leave a useful message here saying argc is that many items. And it will be argc. There we go. And I'll return 0 because I'm not a monster. OK. So if I were to run this program, this program has, I will run it with zero command line arguments. I'm not giving it any additional arguments when I run this program. I'm just going to run it. So, how many arguments are in argc? Zero? One? Two? Negative one? I don't know. Wait, what? One? There aren't any arguments there. What's going on? So, whenever you see something that you don't recognize or you don't understand, I mean, if you're at a train station or at an airport you call security, if you are here writing code, what you do is you experiment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out these command line arguments, all one of them, for which I'm going to need a loop. I'm going to loop over the number of arguments I have. So I'm going to have int i because I'm a monster, int i is 0, while i is less than the number of arguments I have. I'm going to, whoops, let's have an i++ there just in case. I'm going to print out the ith command line argument. Now we've seen we have a nice way of printing out strings. Remember that this here, argv, is an array of strings. So I want the ith thing in this array called argv. That's a string. I can print that out with percent %s. And I will, in fact, just give you a nice little formatted output like that. So we're going to have printf argv of percent %d and percent %s. Our percent %d is going to, of course, be i, because we want the i thing. And our percent %s is going to be argv at i. Yep. Are we happy with this thus far? OK. So let's compile it. Ooh. Oh, this is useful. Here is the zeroth command line argument. To every program that you will run, the zeroth command line argument is the name of your program, the name that your program has. If I were to rename this by either copying this to a new name or creating or, or renaming it by some means, It just works. It just works. It just works. So, what are these rules about what goes in what command line argument? Well, they're not exactly our programs to decide. <coughs> these have already been decided for you back when we invented computers in 1874. 
Yes. Um, the rules for what becomes a command line argument are very, well, strange. It's not necessarily the things with spaces, because space is, as we know, special. But here I have backslash space. The backslash says to the shell, not to our program, but to the shell, that this space doesn't denote the beginning of an argument. This space denotes an actual space. This space should be part of the thing. So what if I were to give it another command line argument? argc is 2. Our first argument, as we saw, is a very long name with spaces in it. argv1 is hello. Hello. What if I were to use this very long name with spaces in it? I've got double quotes around it because double quotes are also special to the shell. And if I were to just leave that there, once again I get a very long name with spaces in it. But if I get rid of those quotes to tell the shell that all of these spaces are command line arguments, then we get a bunch of command line arguments. That's interesting. That's quite useful. OK. So here's a very similar program to the one we've just written. Number, contents of the arguments, we've printed them out. What if we want another way of getting input from users? What if I want to get input from the user from the command line, or from, sorry, from the terminal, and let's say I want them to type in a series of integers, we would use scanf% %d, or if we were feeling really enthusiastic, we would use getchar. But there's another way of doing this, which is to use a really nice little tool called fgets. fgets is a lovely little tool. fgets is a great little function that lives in stud.io. The prototype of fgets, by the way, in case you missed it, is fgets takes as its first argument a character buffer. Somewhere it's going to be able to write the things it read. That's going to be an array. All this means here is an array whose size I don't specify. I also need to provide it a size, so buffer size. And finally, I am going to provide it where I want to read from. And this is a magic thing called, well, a file, amazingly enough. And under most circumstances, you want to be reading from standard input. Uh, some other no uh, terminology for these might be array and array size and stream. Let's see, though, how we can actually use fgets. Let me, let me leave that up there so you can still see it. And let's have an array. Let's have an array with... Hmm. 32 characters. Is anyone uncomfortable with this? Why is this uncomfortable? One of the folks down the front who was quite loud said yes. Why are we uncomfortable with just saying char array of 32? Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, that's a good answer. Yes, I might want to give this a value. Probably should. Why else might I be uncomfortable with just dropping a 32 in here? There are some very enthusiastic hands up the back, but they've all disappeared, so... Yes, absolutely right. This value here, what does it mean? It's just sort of floating in the void we don't know what it means, we don't know what it does. So what we probably want to do is hash define it. I'm going to do that in a moment, so please bear with me with your discomfort. Um, 
For the moment, I won't initialize it. I'll also explain why I'm not doing that in a moment. But now I'm going to read in some input. Into array, I'm going to read in, well, 32 characters from standard input. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to print them out. And yeah, I won't print a new line on the end because there is one. Cool, okay. So let's take this program here and let's compile it. Well, it works. I heard a bunch of people muttering angrily at me. Is there anything wrong with my program? What have I done wrong with my program now? Ooh. How very strange. Let me fix that. Let me just quickly fix that. And... everything goes horribly wrong. Delightful, delightful, just the way I like. That might actually be exactly 32 characters, damn. Let me try doing, so oh, oh. Have you spotted this here? This output that DCC is giving me about what the variables were when execution was stopped because something bad happened. Well, that's weird. And it turns out that what we've done here is something very, very bad. And yes, you should always, always, the number of, I've had a look at some of the assignment ones as well. The number of you who have done this, ooh, it scares me. You should always use constants and constant names. Now let me make that a nice number, not 23. 23 is a nasty number. Cool. Good, good. So we've read in, how many characters is that? That looks suspiciously to me like 31. We've read in 31 characters then. You'll notice we gave fgets a size. fgets knows to stop reading at some point. fgets knows because I tell it to stop reading at some point. Some of you who are perusing my good friend the internet to learn C may have been drawn to the attention of another function called gets. Not f gets, but gets. And you may think this is a viable alternative. If any of you ever use gets, you will be tickled until you cry. <laughs> it is inexcusable to use gets. Gets doesn't check our array. Gets will just keep on reading. Gets will keep on going past the end of that array. And if I were to use it, and I actually don't off the top of my head remember how to use it, because you don't use it. Let me just quickly check my top secret arsenal of incredibly secret notes. Right. 
I love that the documentation for GET says you should never actually... Let me show you this. This is so wonderful. The Unix environment, by the way, has a mechanism for telling you about functions and about the functions in the C standard library, most notably. Here is the documentation for GET. And we scroll, scroll, scroll. And down here in large angry letters, don't ever use gets. Um, on my systems, where I see this, the very top of the documentation says, never use this function. If I were to use gets and to try and read into this array, which is a very bad, very dangerous, very, very not good thing to do, Mmm. Mmm. I get some warnings from the compiler saying, what is this function? We don't know about this function. Because it turns out that people have got, oh god, gets, that's terrifying. Let's just remove that. Because it's that bad. It's still sort of there, but we've taken it out to the point where even the second half of the compiler, what we call the linker, no relation to one of our brightly colored tutors, will tell you that gets is dangerous. <coughs> it turns out that gets just keeps going. It doesn't stop when it reaches the end of the array. It just keeps going. If I were to use something like GCC instead of DCC, not only does it also yell about gets, because even it, the mean, tough, horrible, nasty GCC, knows that gets is a bad idea. So this is a wonderful thing, and this is the last thing I'll mention before we take a short break. I apologize for running a bit long in that first half there. Woo. What I need is not a large talk slower sign, but a large clock. What's happening here is one of the very, very wonderful things that DCC will protect us against, which is that if I walk off the end of an array, what I will do is I can change how my program will run. There is some very, very nasty side effects to that. If you're interested, 1521 goes into a lot more depth about how and why this happens. But for now, this is bad. If you ever see a segmentation fault, or you may see bus error, or you may see a memory error or memory fault, DCC will give you the the message which you will know and come to love, ASAN deadly signal, SEGV. This is bad. Don't do it. All right? So, let's take a break for... Ooh, yeah, let's give you a five-minute break. Ha-ha! <laughs> I'm me. Now, I'll give you a ten-minute break. Stand up! Stretch your legs. We'll see you. Alrighty, alrighty, let's get back to it. I know a number of you have not stood up yet. Why? Has... <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. I don't know how you can sit there for two hours. I really don't. Um, so, we have talked a little bit about... Back, back. We've talked a little bit about command line arguments. We've talked a little bit about fgets. Uh, but I've had a couple of interesting questions uh, about something rather peculiar, which you see in all of these prototypes up here, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But also, if I flip... Ooh, pretty colors. Uh, but also, 
about this char star that's appeared here or over here there's a char star when I was declaring uh, when I was showing you the prototype for fgets there's some char stars what does that mean whoop what happened there uh, uh, uh. shoot um, what does the star mean the star is a really wonderful magical thing in the type position which we see here we're going to talk a little bit more about that after the mid sem break so stay tuned for that for now where you see it you do need to make sure it's there so in chastar argv i can't just drop the star for the same effect yeah the star is a part of the type of this value so in the same way that argc's type here is int the type of argv is char star array. Yeah? Okay. So we've seen a couple of these nice mechanisms for getting data into our program, particularly string data. And we've started playing around with some strings and manipulating strings. So let me give you a couple more functions for manipulating strings. First of all, let me introduce you to my absolute favorite header file. So the same way standard IO, and you may have seen standard lib, are header files. Here's another one that I absolutely love, string.h. String.h is filled with, as you could probably guess, a whole bunch of great wonderful stringy functions that let me do things like take two strings and tell you if they're the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hmm in argc char star argv I'm going to do something interesting which is to write a program that behaves differently depending on what I call it. Yeah? So, first of all, how do I know what this program is called? We talked about this a couple of moments ago. How do I know what this program is called? argv0, yes. Incidentally, argv0 is the only one you can rely on being there. All of the others may not be there. argv1 may not be there. argv2 may not be there. If you are using anything but argv0, you need to check. And the way you do that is by going if argc is equal to or greater than something. For our purposes though, all I want is the name of this program. So I'm going to say argv0. Now what I want to do is I want to compare this. And I want to print out a message if this is equal to something. Say, uh, I don't know, slash string. So this is a very boring program. Elon Musk has invested in it already. Topical humor. Apply to the skin. Um, so we've got here a rather dull and boring program which says is argv0 equal to string. So let's try compiling this. And then call it, call it string. And the compiler is going to have a whinge at me for two reasons. First of all, because I've forgotten to hash include standard io.h. And according to our style rules, that should come before string.h. So let's do that. Whoops. Let's do that again. And now I get an interesting long comparison warning message here. And the warning message says the result of comparison against a string literal is unspecified. This is another 
undefined behavior. I can't do that. I cannot do this and rely on its output. And there's an explanation here saying, I'm trying to compare strings, don't do that. But it was a warning. All it is is a warning. Don't ever actually do this, but... Hang on, what? Our program is called dot slash string, and yet this isn't true. Do I need single quotation marks? Because this is a string literal, no I don't because I need a string. Single quotes around a string are syntactically invalid in C. But also, argv0, well argv is an array of arrays of things. It's not an array. So if I look at argv0, I'm not looking at a character, I'm looking at another character array. Uh, and there's actually, yes, yeah, so I can't just blindly compare using the equality operators, double equal or greater or less or any of their variants. Instead, I need to use one of my all-time favorite functions, which is called stir comp or string compare. Yeah? Now string compare is a wonderful function. String compare says if these character if these character arrays, if these strings that will end with a null, they're strings because there's a null terminator at the end, otherwise it's just a bunch of characters. If these strings are equal the result will be zero. Equal to zero. If the comparison of these two strings is zero, then this program is called dot slash string. But, if, now here's where it gets interesting. If the strings I am comparing, if one is lexicographically greater than the other. If the first is greater than the second, the result will be positive. If the first is less than the second, the result will be negative. Now the temptation might be to say, well, if this is less than, sorry, if this is equal to minus one, because that's less than zero, but no, you have to compare less than zero or greater than zero or equal to zero, yeah? Before I get too much further, how many of you are doing discrete maths? Math 1081. How many have to do it? How many are still to do it? Fantastic. All right. Discrete maths is an interesting course, shall we say. I think it's personally one of my favorite maths courses I've ever done. Yes, yes, I know. This is where I would slag out maths if I wasn't being recorded. Um, but in discrete maths, there's this idea that they mention, and this is discrete maths, just uh, for those of you who don't have to do it or don't need to do it or don't want to do it, and I suspect many of you don't want to do it but have to anyway, discrete maths is filled with all of the maths of computer science. All of the maths that makes these systems work, all of the logic, all of the theory and mechanism that makes computer systems work. It's a great course and e oh, I just hate the fact that it is taught so badly and that everyone hates it. But one of the things they tell you about is a thing that I like to call the rocket ship. The what now? The rocket ship. If I am comparing two values. The result of that comparison could be three things, yeah? They can be less than or equal to or greater than. Looks like a rocket ship. It's great. Sturkamp is what we call, or what I like to call, and I think a few other people have picked this up for some reason, a rocket ship comparator. 
Inasmuch as it will tell you if something is less than or equal to or greater than. It doesn't just say is this equal or not, it says is it less equal or greater. And you can use that information really usefully. You can say is this equal or lexicographically greater. Also there's this whack word that I've been using lexicographically. For those of you who may not um, may not be able to understand my hideous accent or are just stumped by the word, lexicographically, there it is. Let me, let me uncomment that. It is a hideous word that English is a train wreck. I hate it as a language. Lexicographically means just by characters, by the character ordering. So lexicographically is actually lexicographically greater than lexicographical, uh, sorry, no, it's lexicographically less than that. Yep. Yeah? Does this give you a hint about what we mean by lexicographical comparison? Yeah? We are ordering characters effectively in each place and saying, is this one greater, equal, or less? Is this one greater, equal, or less? And we could build one of these functions. In fact, let's do that. Let's build Sturkamp. Sturkamp takes two arrays and it returns an int. I'll call it string compare because A, I'm, well, I'm not lazy because I've typed out many more characters, but I'm very unimaginative. And this is going to take a character array, string A, and a character array, string B. White space is good for you. All right? And I'm going to use my string compare. And let's define this. So we've got int string compare takes char string A and char string B. So, the first thing I want to know is where do I run out of string? What, what lets me work out where I'm at the end of this array? Because previously when we've been working with, a, with arrays, remember, I have to know how long the array is. Yeah? So how long are these arrays? Well, I don't know. I don't have any way of knowing. But I do know what I can find at the end of a string. Yes. So I can compare for that. I can look for this. So if I have some value i, I'm going to walk along my array from 0 up to string A is the null terminator or string B is the null terminator at I. String A at I, is that equal, or is that not equal rather, to the null terminator? And string B at I is not equal to the null terminator. But while that's true, uh, yeah, I'll put that up there. Mm, mm, mm. Let me put that down there. Yeek. Like that. And we're going to do I++. So what are we going to do? How do I know if these strings are, one string is greater, equal, or less than the other? Well, I've got to compare each character. So if string A at I is equal to string B at I, then we're going to keep going. Otherwise, we're going to have to do something. So if string A is le at i is less than string b at i we now need to say well we've now seen a point in this string 
where it makes no sense to continue. Yeah? And the same would be true with greater than. So we don't really need this condition at all. We can just do it as the else branch. So if it is equal, we would continue. If it's not equal, then I say, hmm, I'm going to return something that is not zero, something that is positive or negative. Now, if I'm looking at two strings, two arrays of characters, and I'm looking at, say, the first one of these, they're equal. I'm looking at the second one of these, they're equal. I'm looking at the third one of these, well, string A is less than string B in this position, so obviously string A compared to string B here is less than zero, yes, less than zero, yes? What do we see here that might be less than zero? How about the difference in their values? If I were to take string A, whoa, what the? String A at I minus string B at I, that would be less than zero if one of these is less than and greater than zero if one of these is greater than, yeah? Of course, I need a ret vowel, so let's have a ret vowel. Int ret vowel is zero. And ideally, I'd like to stop going through the loop if I've hit one of these. So what do I do? What do I have to do for this? Uh, there's an I++ plus plus here, yes. I could add a condition to my while loop that says while these strings are still equal. While these strings are still equal and I haven't run out of each string, I will look at the string and go, are these things equal? This if here is also empty in its true branch, so we can get rid of its true branch. That's it. And now all I need to do is return retval. Yeah? So here's a good question. I've just written my wonderful whizbang function. I love this function, it's great. How do I know it's right? Yep, I heard that. Make a string A, make a string B, compare the two. What do we have that tells me, though, whether something has gone wrong in a comparison and I am testing code? I hear it from some gentle folk down here. Anyone else? I hear it from some gentle folk down here. Anyone up the back awake still? No, apparently not. Okay, so for the gentle folk who are down the front, I'm glad you're still with us. Yes, I want to have a selection of asserts. So what I'm going to do is, yes, I'm going to start out by asserting that the comparison of these strings I'm going to compare string A and string B. And these are obviously going to be, well, one's going to be less than zero. One's going to be less than the other, so the result will be less than zero. Yeah? Are we happy with this assertion? I assert that these two strings, these two things that I know about, have this property that when I compare them, the result is less than zero. And for bonus points, let's just check what Sturkamp does in the same circumstance. And let's compile this. Oops, I haven't included assert.h. 
You know how Andrew forgets prototypes? Yeah, I forget includes. It's terrible. Mainly because I tend to just include everything and then everything is fine. Cool. So first of all, our string comparison works. Our string comparison hasn't crashed our program. That assertion hasn't failed. And also, stercom here, as string compare would, I can just compare these strings and the result is zero, yeah? Fantastic. So it says gotcha, and of course if I were to compile this out as, say, a completely innocent program, it just looks completely dull and boring. All right? So we have this set of assertions so far. Let me just pop the stercom above. Let's try something else. Let's try another assertion, but this time an assertion of equality. String A and string A are the same. Yeah? This also should be true. And we'll go back to using the old name. This assertion also is true. And of course, if I use, uh, let's say, string B and string B, and I compare those with string A, the result is going to be greater than zero because one of these is greater than the other. Yes? Happy with this? So, I've written three tests. Actually, I've written six, but I've three of them test my code. Question. Are these enough tests? Who reckons this is enough tests we can just finish and that's the end of them? Okay, nobody wants to admit that they don't want to do any more testing. Who thinks this isn't enough tests? Okay, that's more promising. What else might I want to test? What other tests do I want to add here? I heard strings of different lengths. What other things might I want to test for? No strings. no strings? Or the empty string? Yeah. The empty string is a beautiful thing. What else might I want to test for? Oh, yes. I like the way you're thinking there. So we've got a null that's been put into our string somewhere other than at the end. Yep. What else might I want to test? Something that isn't a string. Ooh, yes. All right. Well, we'll start with the easy one of these, which is the empty string, and we'll go through the rest of these. So with the empty string, I'm going to compare that the empty string is equal to zero. Yeah? I'm going to use my function as well as stercom. OK. Let me fix this test message. Cool. So we've got the empty string, that seems okay to me. Let's say I want to test a string that's got a null in the middle of it. And again, I'm going to use my function as well. What do I expect? 
expect to happen if I have a null in the middle of a string? If I just drop a null into the middle of a string like this, how do I know that I have more string after this? Do I know that I have more string after this? How can I know that? Remember that we don't know how long an array is. We don't know whether we've run into the end of an array. If the array is a string, we do, because we're looking for the null terminator. So functionally, this is going to be the same as comparing, for example, this, where I'm comparing just the string A with the string A null B. Yeah? Out of sheer paranoia, let's also test that. Ah, uh, that still has to be on two lines, curse. Let me shrink that down a little. Not that much. There we go. Okay. So let's check that. Incidentally, the way I'm doing this, which is coming up with tests after I've written my program, is completely, is completely wrong. It's completely backwards. How do I know if my program that I'm writing is even correct? if I haven't set out to check it before I begin, if I haven't worked out what it's going to do. So let's try our next case, which is strings of different lengths. I'm going to compare, well, the empty string is a nice obvious string. I'm going to compare that with a string A. And I'm going to say, well, a is obviously greater than the empty string. Yeah? Are we happy with that? Cool. And again, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to use string compare to compare those things. Ooh. Ooh. Ah, but I have that assertion backwards. Let's try that again, but with me remembering how numbers work. That's better. So now we have a problem, which is that my assertion here of ordering between the empty string and A is wrong. Why? What's gone wrong here? Is it just that I've forgotten how numbers work? Well, we can find out by recompiling that. Well, that's obviously not right either. So let's check zero. What? What have we missed here? I'm, remember, I'm comparing the empty string with a string with one character in it. Here's our code again. What have I forgotten? Here's a scenario that I want to paint for you. In fact, let's have a look at what's going on here as we go through this. With, whoops, with both A and the empty string. Yeah? So as I'm going through this loop, I is zero, so we're looking at this first character here. Here, effectively, I've got the empty string, the null terminator. Incidentally, you don't have to add the null terminator onto your strings. It's automatically added for you, unless you're doing something evil. All right, so I compare 0. I compare that to A. What do I get? Well, retval is 0 already, still. String A is now 0. So this condition is false. So I fall out with that being the case. Hmm. How do I deal with this? Well, 
what I have to do is not only to check all of the characters of the section of my strings that are of the same length, but now I have to check the remainders of these strings. So I now would have to check string A at I. If that's not equal to zero, then I haven't run out of string A yet, but I have run out of string B. And I can even state that explicitly, but I don't have to, because logically, the only reason I could be here with string A at I equal to zero is because I've run out of string B? Yes? No? People have gone back to sleep again? Yo! Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. So this is an interesting quirk, which is that if I have reached this point, it's possible that I haven't yet run out of both strings. It's possible that all I'm there. It's possible that all I'm looking at is one of these strings is well, they're the same length, but one of them has a character that differs. So I do actually have to explicitly check string B at I is equal to zero before I can do, well, string A has concluded after string B would, so string A is less than string B? Or have I got that backwards? Well, one way we can find out is pick one and we'll roll with it, we'll check our tests. So retval here would obviously be, we'll just say minus one. And for the other case, which is else if string A at I is zero, but string B at I is not zero, which for reasons unknown to me somehow is a line breaking I don't know who invents these computer things retval is positive one good enough for me let's see what happens so let's go and check our tests we want to be matching the behavior of circump so oh let me get rid of that commentary up the top of this function always helps if I do that Hmm, it looks like our function is wrong. This is one of the places where it's really, really important to write your tests before you start throwing code at the wall. You need to know what your code is going to do before you actually go and do it, yeah? So, maybe this is backwards, let's flip it. Well, that seems promising. Let's try some more strings of different length. And this time, let's have those strings of different lengths be the other way around. So A and the empty string instead of the empty string and A. And this, fairly obviously, should be the other way around. So let's try that. It looks good. And the last one of these is I want to pass in something that's not a string. Okay. Let's try having something that's not a string. Forty-two. Nice pretty number. There's a tutor who's now looking grumpy at me. Forty-two is an incredibly overused demo number, but I like it anyway. And as above, I'm just going to pass that into these functions. And what happens is, uh oh, ah, ah, ha, ha, ha. good. Okay, what's happening here is a compile warning. The compiler is telling us what we're about to do is a bad idea. So let's do it anyway. It's a seg fault. 
which seems like a great place to stop on a crashing program. Why is this crashing, you ask? What is going on?